Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of At Ping, last one for the year. I uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. Let's get to the questions. First one comes from Doug, and uh, he's got a video submission. Thank you. I love it. Finally got some more of these. Uh, let's hear from him. Hey Ping, this is Doug Korn from Signal Mountain, Tennessee, right outside of Chattanooga. Uh, I've been following you a long time, uh, all the way back to the electronic ping and broken KTMs, in fact. So I really like your your work, really like the Whiskey Throttle Show. You're doing a good job. Hope you guys had a Merry Christmas. Question I have, my son and I were talking about pro contracts. And I'm just wondering, what is the nitty gritty that we don't all know about them? I know they make different contracts for different level of riders. I know all the way from the elites all the way down to the top 10 or 15. What, what might be in there that people don't really know? Are they prohibited from doing things? Um, money, how's it relate to injuries, um, time off the bike for other reasons or whatever. Just wondering what that might look like. And I know you being an insider, probably seen your share of contracts or heard about them anyway. Anyway, happy new year and take care. Keep up the good work. Be safe out there. First of all, I love your shirt, Doug. Thank you for that. Thanks for uh, supporting the show. Uh, with pro contracts, um, the thing that you need to really understand is that everything's negotiable. I get asked a lot from kind of up and coming kids and privateers, you know, like, hey, is it worth it for me to have an agent? Is that worth the money, the 10% that they take or whatever it is? And I always say, eh, until you're really negotiating decent money, probably not worth it. Anything under a hundred grand, you can, you can work that out yourself. Those are pretty basic contracts. Those are support rides and trying to get you up into a, a good position. Once you're, um, once you're making like anything over that and, and there's, there's, there's a lot more to negotiate, probably better that you have an agent. Um, but as far as the things you can discuss, salary, bonuses, gear, uh, even parts, you know, Eli had to negotiate to get KYB on his Cowie over there because he liked the feel of that better. All of that stuff's negotiable. They don't like to do some of it, but when you've got leverage like he does, you can get that kind of stuff done. You can also set it up differently. Do you want to be salary heavy? So a, like a good chunk coming in for sure. And then your bonuses are much smaller. Or like what Carmichael always used to do is he'd, he'd let him bring the salary down a little bit and then he'd just stack the bonuses. Or he'd stack the bonuses differently. Some guys want to be paid first through 10. And so each one's going to be a little less. Or like what Ricky did was he made the win bonuses astronomical, but he got very little or nothing for second, third, and down. So you can, it's, you know, there, a lot of it is just kind of pushing numbers around, but some of that stuff is negotiable. Uh, a lot of the things that you maybe wouldn't think of, can't use competing products, right? It's kind of a no-brainer, but this is what got Jeremy back in 96 was he was going out riding watercraft, okay? And so whether that's a Yamaha Superjet or a Kawasaki uh, jet ski, Honda wasn't real stoked on that. So uh, that was something that caused some issues. He wanted to be able to do it. They don't make one. So he's like, you know, a stand up. So it, it caused some issues. And then lastly, this is something that's very important for riders and it's, it, it's adjusted different ways, but that's an injury clause. So do you negotiate that they continue to pay you regardless of whether you're racing or not? A lot of them will have a, a, a period of maybe three or four months where they continue to pay you the full amount. And after four months, if you're not back to racing, then it drops to half your salary. If after nine months or six months, you're not back yet, it drops to even less. So that's all negotiable. And I guess that's the biggest thing that I can, can kind of leave you with is that pretty much anything and everything's on the table and it's up for you, up to you and your agent to go in and, and make it look the way you want. So, uh, and a lot of that is dependent on, do you have any leverage? You know, do you have other teams making you offers? If you can go, well, either you give me what I want or I'm going over here. That makes it really tough for them. But if you don't have anything, they can just go, here's the offer, sign it or get out of here. So anyway, thank you for the letter or the video. I appreciate it. I love the video submissions. Uh, here's our next one. Let's have a look. Hey, Ping, quick question for you. I wonder if you think we will ever see a pro rider competing in the premier class on one of the Austrian 350 bikes. You, uh, you read about their power being uh, getting closer and closer to the 450 level, uh, but that they handle much more like a 250F with less uh, engine inertia, better cornering, um, and that sort of thing. So um, I, that would seem like that the handling would be an advantage in tight confines like Supercross or tighter motocross tracks. 
Um, but maybe the reduction in power just uh, is too big of a disadvantage on the starts. Maybe that's the issue. I don't know. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. All right. Thank you for that. So will pro riders ever ride a 350? You know, way back when the 350 first came out, uh, Caroli was using it effectively over in the GPs. And I think that it's a little apples to oranges. You got to remember that's they, they can still build work spikes over there. So they can custom make that thing. Tony's not a super heavy guy and, and he made it work. And I think it, you know, it, it, it roped some guys in over here. Andrew Short ended up riding it for a while. And just at the end of the day, it doesn't have the torque. And there's some certain little key spots where you just, there's no replacement for that. Maybe, maybe the, the total horsepower on a 450 is too much for a tight stadium. But man, when you got to come out of a turn and really get up over something, you either have the torque or you don't. When you're coming off of the gate at a national and it's tilled two feet deep, you either have that torque or you don't. And to give up starts or give up rhythms or be in a deep set of whoops and have it kind of fall off because you're not quite making the torque or power numbers, you're giving up something. And what are you getting in return? To your point, because it is a little bit less rotating mass, it does have a lighter feel. But at the end of the day, if you look at the, the weight of a 350 versus the weight of the modern 450, on those Australian brands, Austrian brands, there's it's actually the 450s are lighter because remember they went and redesigned that whole engine package and shaved off a bunch of weight off all that. The 350 didn't get that, so there's no actual weight savings. Although it does feel a little bit lighter, you're giving up torque and horsepower for a lighter feeling. And I just think guys are good enough. They they've learned to manage the 450 power. They can set up the um, the mapping and things to really make it feel as light and playful as they want or spread the power out so it comes on smoother. They can really adjust it any way they want. And so you can make a 450 almost feel like a 350, but without giving up the torque, if that makes sense. So I just think there's not enough benefit and too much to lose going to that. I don't think you're going to see guys do it unless they come up with something different. You know, maybe there is a new model that comes out and that could change things. But as things are right now, I don't see it. So uh, thank you for the question. And our last one comes from Joe. It says, Ping, it's been a long time. It was over 22 years ago, I hit you up on Ask Ping about something you responded to on there. Well, long story short, have not rode a race in 15 plus years. Kept up with the sport and all, but just turned 50 and said, I need to get back at it now or never will. Talked to my friends still riding and they all said, get a 450, you can be lazy on it. Well, my dumb ass went and bought a 22 CRF 450. Can't ride that thing worth a crap. Don't know if it's the four-stroke thing or just too much power. Got on a guy's 22 KTM 125 and was pulling 10 second a lap time faster than I was on my 450 and having more fun. I could just put it where I wanted to and did not feel like my arms were getting ripped off. So my question is, is it common with some vet racers getting back into it that never raced the four strokes to struggle getting used to them? I had to switch up and purchase the 22 KTM 150 SX and I love it. So much more comfortable on it. Well, just wanted to get your thoughts. Oh, and I have a 22 CRF 450 with five hours on it for sale if you know somebody. <laughs> Take care, Joe. Uh, you know, it is common. Um, and it, this is something we don't think a lot about. Younger kids, they don't know anything but four strokes. And older guys, you know, a lot of us don't, don't know anything but two strokes. And so I tell this to people all the time who are not sure about which bike to buy. I say, unless you're racing really competitively, and you're really trying to progress your skill and, and be as fast as you can be, pick the bike you're having the most fun on. So you you answered your own question. You said you were having more fun and smiling and you happen to be faster on it, good for you. And at the end of the day, you're in more control of that bike. You feel like you're riding it rather than the other way around and that's safer. And man, I, you're riding longer, you have more fun and you're safer on it. I think it's a pretty much a no brainer there. And I don't think you're alone. I think the, the four strokes are definitely a different style of riding. The engine brake changes things, the, the way that that power comes on, the way you have to ride it, it's completely different, you know? And I imagine you were probably on the clutch a lot on the 450, like you would be on a two stroke and that's that's a no-no. So you, you would have to completely shift the way you know how to ride and adjust to that. And I think you could get there, but if you just wanna get on and have fun, like it sounds like you do, uh, that KTM 150 is a really fun bike. Sounds like you made a good choice. So, uh, you're not alone. Lots of folks, I'm sure in the same boat as you. And, uh, I appreciate the time sending in the letter. 
Hope you enjoy that new bike. And hey, Happy New Year to everybody. I uh, hope you guys uh, had a good 21 or got through it. And um, let's all hope and pray that 2022 is a good year and we can get back to a little more normalcy, huh? All right. See you next year.